recent postdoc, Shazi Zeng, a recent graduate student uh, at UW, uh, Hoyt Kepke, and my current graduate student, Chris Glazner. We'll see how it works. Uh, so the same setup, uh, the setup of mapping that I'm sure is familiar to all of you, although it's uh, rather different from what a lot of this workshop has been about. Uh, we want to try and find where in the genome are the genes that affect particular traits. And what we have are usually genetic, genetic marker data, uh, usually SNP data, whether from called from sequences or, or, or from your SNP chips, uh, and your trait data. And the <laughs> classic association test, which you're all familiar with, says just look at the association between the traits and the allelic types at your SNPs. And as we heard this morning, there are various problems and difficulties with the straight association test. But for me, one of the biggest problems with it is that it really ignores the structure of our genomes. It really ignores the fact that our genome descends in blocks over the generations, and quite large blocks if we're talking generation to generation or in recent generations. Uh, and it also ignores the fact that the actual functional genes are in blocks, uh, or uh, blocks may be separated by introns and everything else, but they're basically blocks. And there are many, many ways to many different variants within a functional gene. So that if you do an association test, as we'll see, you know, it's, you've got big problems with allelic heterogeneity. So instead, I, I take the view that we should go back to what we used to do in pedigrees. We're now going to do it in populations, not pedigrees. But what we need to look at is an association in the descent of the, uh, of the SNPs and the descent of the trait. Uh, and we do that through looking at so-called identity <coughs> by descent which I'm not going to go into how to redefine it, but I think of it just as relative to some ancestral population, some time point in the past. And we say that our chunk of DNA is identical by descent if it's a copy of the same chunk of DNA in some common ancestor of my individuals in that population. And the whole idea behind identity by descent based mapping is rather than, as I say, looking at directly at the association between the trait and the lenic type of the SNP, is to look at the association in shared descent with similarity in phenotype. So that's the basic, basic idea. Uh, whoops. Yes, OK. Now, we, we're going to do model-based inference. Uh, and we all know what the model for descent really should be. If we really wanted to have a, quote, true model, it should be the ancestral recombination graph. But unfortunately, the ancestral recombination graph, point made by Simon Myers this morning, is much too complicated to use for the sorts of problems I want to use it for. Uh, various people have made valiant attempts to use it for inference, Mary Cooner at University of Washington being one of them, and using sequential Markov approximations to the coalescent. Uh, Shazi Zeng has also done some work that's even expanded it by, I think, at least an order of magnitude in terms of the lengths of the segments you can look at and do inference for. But that's far shorter than the segments I want to look at, because I'm interested in fairly recent identity <laughs> by descent over the last maybe 50 generations, maybe going up to 100 generations. Uh, I'm th therefore interested in segments of the genome that are millions of base pairs long. Uh, and most of the ancestral combination graph, as we know, is that deep history. And really, that's irrelevant to what we want to look at. Uh, emphasizing again that what we're interested in are these long segments of recent descent, the same picture, or well, same idea, uh, presented by Itzik yesterday. Uh, and actually, I always date it to work by my very first PhD student, Kevin Donnelly, who is not the famous Donnelly. <laughs> it's a different Donnelly. But uh, he did this thing that I think was great and very relevant to what we do today, uh, showing, well, we all knew, knew of course, already that was the probability of identity by descent at any particular location in genome decreases exponentially with the uh, number of meioses of separation, and also that the probability of sharing any genome in your autosomal genome also decreases uh, eventually exponentially uh, once it gets going. Uh, but the length of an identity by descent segment only decreases as 1 over the number of meioses. So these red guys, for example, who are separated by 12 meioses over here, the probability of their identity by descent at any particular point in the genome, prior probability before we look at any data, of course, is 5 in 10,000. There's a reasonable probability that they do have some segment uh, of their autosomal genome identical by descent, and the expected length of that segment is 8.5 million base pairs. The effect is more extreme as I go to more remote relatives, individuals, those blue guys, separated by 20 meioses. There, there's only a chance at two in a million at any point in the genome that they'll share identity by descent. 
And interestingly, only one in a thousand such pairs will share any of their autosomal genome identity by descent. So I think that this really speaks against this idea of detecting relatedness in remote relatives. You're not detecting relatedness uh, you, if you're talking about this sort of level, because most of the people who are related at that level won't share any of their autosomal genome identical by descent. But a few pairs will. And again, if they are, you're again, you're talking about lengths of the order of millions of base pairs. So these segments of identity <laughs> by descent are rare but not short, as Kevin put it just over 30 years ago. Uh, and it's the human genome. Come on. What's okay? <laughs> the human genome uh, that is that is short. Uh, uh, yeah, in these, in these terms, human genome is short. The next sort of preliminary point that I want to make is that if I know the identity by descent, I know everything I need to know, whether I'm talking about a pedigree or a population. Given, so here's a little example that is a little pedigree, where it's me and my two cousins from my granddad. We share at a particular locus this red one identical by descent. And my cousin C actually shares his paternal one identical by descent from his dad at this locus. I don't need to know that if I'm interested in analyzing data just on me and my two cousins. All I need to know is that little graph up the top that I have a blue and a red one. I share the red one with my cousin C, who shares the pink one with his brother D. And if I write, want to write down the probability, for example, that uh, C is at a slip, maybe, that this guy is homozygous, uh, that uh, and I and D are uh, heterozygous, then we immediately look at that graph and say, OK, immediately, what have I got? The red and pink ones have got to be a little a, the other two have got to be a little b. I've got two a's and two b's, probability, frequency of a squared, frequency of b squared, and I'm done. And I can equally, if I have some model for some quantitative trait, equally, well, almost equally easily, write down the probability of the trait data that I see and compute that probability simply by summing up over the potential allelic types to that, to that local haplotype or local genome uh, attributed to the trait. So the trait data depends on the allelic types of the two DNA chunks that you carry. <coughs> so that's great. But now we want to go from pedigrees. We just want to think about populations. In a population, it might very well be that my marker data suggests, or somebody tells me, that my uncle by marriage and my granddad are actually related as well. And that actually, at this locus, the pink one and the red one are also identical by descent. And the, writing down the probabilities is then even easier, because all it does is claps the graph. So the red one and the pink one are now the same thing. C has two copies of the now red one. If I want to write down this same probability, what do I have? I have, I have that, I have that, uh, I have now have one A and two Bs, one A and two Bs, and I'm done. But in order to do that, I need some population problem model. I need some population probability model to combine these that gives me some probability of bringing the case when they're not identical and the place when they are identical. Uh, so we're going to need uh, we're going to need to make inferences of IBD from our SNP data, uh, but we're also going to need models that give us prior probabilities of those things. Now, can this IBD-based mapping again? This is sort of sort of set up uh, just to start things off. Can this IBD-based mapping work? And with Sharon, and mainly it was Sharon uh, Browning, a couple of years ago, we did a simple study just to say, well, can it, is there enough power? Uh, and so what she did was a simulation study, simulating an evolutionary population, uh, which she then, uh, so she simulated the base population with selection and recombination, and then from that base population ran it down to 25 generations. In this example, we did various examples, uh, and we were measuring our identity by descent, which we assumed we could observe, uh, relative to that 25 generation base. And she was basically simulating a gene region of 200 kilobase pairs, and these are alternating blocks of one KB. Uh, and the central KB, you could think of these as a very artificial uh, five exons of a gene. That's where the causal SNPs are. Uh, and to have marker SNPs, she took one, the most informative one that arose in each of these uh, one kilobase pair blocks. So we've got 100 nice marker SNPs. <coughs> Uh, so we didn't want to do down association mapping. We wanted association mapping to do as well as it could do. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we had causal variants uh, that arose in our simulation that were in those five central blocks. 
Uh, typically, there are order of magnitude 10. It didn't depend too much a total in the population variance, total in those five uh, central blocks and uh, realizations. And, in the, and we didn't want to, we wanted to have a signal, but we didn't want it to be so strong that you couldn't tell anything. That, uh, so we made it so that individuals with at least one causal variant became cases rather than controls with probability 10%. So not a, so, a, so something we can actually detect, uh, because otherwise there wouldn't be any point doing the study, but not something that was so extreme that somebody could say, well, you're just looking at a, quote, Mendelian trait or simple trait or whatever. And we did our standard association tests, of course, in the identity by descent-based tests. Again, we were looking at identity by descent, so we were looking at shared IBD in case-case pairs as compared with other pairs, case-non-case -case pairs or non-case-non-case -case pairs. Uh, in any real study, of course, there tends to be a difference in relatedness between your cases and your controls for just uh, for, due to population uh, heterogeneity, uh, basically. Uh, and so we adjusted for that by adjusting for the genome-wide average in the group, and then we did permutation testing to give us our significance. So we did the standard things. Uh, and this is just one set of our results, and the results, once you see them, they're not at all surprising. When selection is fairly weak, you have roughly the same number of total variants, but the frequencies of those variants are higher. So the total frequency of haplotypes carrying at least one causal variant uh, was of the order of 5% up to 13%. And so, uh, so the, the cases, there tended to be some SNP with which you had a very strong association between the trait and that market SNP. So association mapping did pretty well, even in a very small study, and did rather better than the IBD test. In fact, substantially better than the IBD-based test. But as selection got stronger, so your separate variants and even your total frequency of your variants got quite a lot lower, then there tended not to be an association of your trait with any, with any one of your market SNPs. Uh, you, you needed larger studies, of course, to even get some reasonable power that, that you could compare. <laughs> and the IBD-based test was winning out. So that's, that's published a couple of years ago now, it's quite old, but it does show that IBD-based mapping can work and can uh, do things in populations where you have allelic heterogeneity uh, and where, how do I stop it doing this? Okay, go faster I guess is the answer. <laughs> Okay, so something I was interested in even before that work in, with Sharon, but now became much more interested in, is I don't just want to look at pairwise IBD, but either between pairs of chromosomes or even between pairs of individuals. I want to look at samples from my population and look at the joint IBD structure, like those little graphs with me and my two cousins, uh, and, and hopefully even larger graphs. Uh, so we have these, uh, what we call I the identity by descent graphs, which just show for my sample in the individuals, uh, each one, of course, having two DNA nodes, this particular locus, which ones they're sharing with which other individuals in the population. And these might be just the ones who are sharing out of my sample. There might be a lot of other individuals who at this particular location don't share anything. Uh, and one point I want to make is, uh, is that, in fact, pairwise sharing, even even intrinsically doesn't give you all the information. Uh, th so this structure is a very different structure. Here we have three individuals who share one IBD node. Here you have three individuals who each share one with the other individual. If you just look at your data pairwise, there's no difference between those situations. But they obviously have very different uh, uh, structures and could have very different uh, effects in terms of their trait, depending on the architecture of the trait, very different implication for the trait. And the other thing to point out is that your data could be uh, just affected and unaffected in your population, but on the whole, you do a lot better if you have uh, some sort of quantitative trait or at least ranked values of traits. Uh, and what, you, again, you're, what you're looking for is an association between sharing genome, that is identity by descent, and similarity of trait values. Okay, okay what's next? Okay, well, before we can do any of that, okay, everything I've done so far says, okay, assume that I can see this identity by descent. The first thing we've got to do is define the identity by descent. And again, uh, it's sort of basically mentioned how you do this. Uh, we want to do a model-based inference. Uh, uh, and again, this, comes, this came up in Simon's talk again this morning. Uh, if you do a model-based inference, a probability-based inference, you have measures of uncertainty. Uh, and also, it allows you to give multiple realizations from that posterior probability distribution given the SNP data. Uh, so, 
um, so uh, yeah, uh, and then you can use those multiple realizations in analyzing the trait. I want multiple imputations jointly across the a genome or chromosome, a genome segment, whatever you like. And of course, we want to combine the information from SNPs across the genome. Uh, each SNP alone gives almost no information about identity by descent. But because it comes in these larger segments with more and larger segments, segments of millions of base pairs uh, in, a, in a pair of chromosomes at least, uh, then we can detect them simply by having a very simple model where if they're identical by descent, they should be of the same allelic type. And if they're not identical by descent, in some sense, they're, quote, independent allelic types. So we're going to need two things, a model for the process of identity by descent along the chromosome. Uh, and I'll show you a couple of models. Uh, and uh, more importantly, which I'm not going to talk so much about, but it turns out to be the much more critical part in actually getting things to work well, is a model for your SNP data given the underlying identity by descent. Uh, so a very simple model for the identity by descent and inferring identity by descent, which, which all our current models, the reason I'm showing you is that all our current models are basically generalizations of this. Uh, Anne-Louise Leutnegger, a student of mine back in uh, 2003, uh, she was just comparing identity by descent between the pair of gametes within an individual. By the way, I tend to call them gametes because haplotypes and chromosomes and all those words have so many other connotations. The gametes are the haploid genomes of my individuals, and it's unambiguous. OK, two gametes. Uh, they just have segments where they're not identical by descent, and then small, on the typically smaller segments where they are identical descent, not they are. So it's just a two-state process. You would have a very simple two-parameter Markov model uh, where the marginal probability, the point-wise probability of being identical by descent is some beta the change rate, uh, sort of global change rate, uh, of changes into IBD, uh, rarer than changes out of IBD, that the IBD segments are shorter, but the global rate that scales things is just this one single parameter alpha. Uh, and of course, this is an approximation. Identity by descent is not Markov, and expected lengths depends on the length, number of meioses to the common ancestors we're talking about and there may be multiple common ancestors, but this is certainly a good enough model for the Rosa prior. And then the, mo the model that she used uh, is the one we just said. If they're identical by descent, they should be the same allelic type uh, here and here. If they're not identical by descent, they may or may not be the same allelic type. And actually, in all our models, we allow for, quote, error, <laughs> fuzz of some kind or other, whether we believe there are errors or not, you should always make that allowance so that things that are observed of different allelic type can still be inferred to be IBD or to be within an IBD segment. And this, of course, is a very, very simple HMM with just two latent states. So you compute along, you compute backwards, you can get the probability of IBD at each point, at each point along the genome. Uh, and more importantly, from my point of view, again, because we're going to want realizations, you can get joint realizations of the IBD by computing forwards and going backwards along the genome across the chromosome uh, in your standard HMM type, type way. OK, but now we want to extend this model to multiple gametes. So we're going to need, first thing we're going to need is simply a model for the IBD partition of my gametes at a given point in the genome. Well, Ewan's more than 40 years ago, gave us a beautiful one-parameter distribution for the partition of n objects into k groups. He uses a model of, of, of allelic variation, but it's equally good as a model of any sort of partition with just that one parameter, uh, uh, which this is it's in the form of u and theta. This may be slightly more familiar to people who know u and sampling formula. It's just two different ways of writing the same thing. And we can use this as a model of a partition of our n gametes at any point into uh, some number of IBD groups, a model for the IBD partition. Uh, here's this in terms of genetic variation theta. I want something in terms of this pairwise probability of IBD beta, but it's very easy to translate from one to the other because if I simply plug into the formula for two gametes, the probability that they are in the same partition just turns out to be 1 over 1 plus theta, and that's my beta. So I can go from one to the other with no problem. That's nice. But now I also need a model for how this is going to change, a prior model for how my IBD partitions are going to change as I go along the chromosome. 
Uh, these are IBD graphs. They're fairly dense ones because they actually came from pedigree example originally, but uh, that you can just think of them as the same little graphs showing my individuals, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, well, what they share with other individuals. For example, up there at the top, A, B, J, and G all share that one that is arbitrarily labeled 2. As I go along the chromosome, there are going to be recombination events in the ancestry of these gametes. So for example, there might be a, the, a recombination in the ancestry that led to this gamete here that actually moved this K, this gamete, this, or this individual K, from sharing that one not sharing with anybody else who happens to be observed, but instead sharing with D, G, and F. So what it does is simply move this gamete K1 into this, uh, this, this group here, IBD group here. As I go a bit further along the chromosome, I might find that, for example, the thing leading to the zero gamete of individual J, uh, currently B and J share both their gametes identical by descent, but then there might be a recombination in the uh, ancestry leading to that particular gamete of J, which would actually move J, the zero gamete of J, out of the group. So the gametes move into and out of, or in between groups, uh, in that sort of way. And we need a model for that. Well, again, this is familiar to many people here. There's a really neat way to build up the Yuan sampling formula, known as the Chinese restaurant process. So we've got a Chinese restaurant with uh, any number of tables of any, any size. And currently, there are n people in there who happen to be k-occupied tables. And the new person comes in, and they see a friend with probability proportional to the number of people at, the, at that table. So they join that table with probability proportional to the number of people sitting there. Uh, or they sit down at a new empty table with a probability proportional to uh, well, one, minus, 1 minus that probability. Uh, so a little example here. We've just got six gametes, three occupied tables, three, two, and one. The new one comes in, sits down with probability proportional, so three beta, two beta, beta, or sits down at an empty table with probability uh, proportional to one minus beta. Uh, and then you just have your new state, right, with the new gamete. And it's very easy to show that if you pre previously had the Ewan sampling formula on, in this case, six gametes, then your new state is Ewan sampling formula on seven gametes. That's all very well, but I want to have a Ewan sampling formula as my marginal distribution on a fixed number of n gametes. I don't want to keep increasing my number of gametes, right? And as I say, all the best ideas are simple in retrospect, but this is a very neat idea due to Shazi Zeng on how to do this. Uh, and allows any one gamete essentially to move from one IBD subset to another. So potential changes in IBD now are going to occur at this some normalized rate alpha along the chromosome. We don't worry about that, what that is. And at, at a, each uh, potential change point, we add a new gamete in exactly the same way we did before. He joins the tables with proportion to the number of people already there, or at a new table with probability 1 minus beta, and get my new state. But now, I randomly select one of the n plus 1 gametes, in this case 7 gametes, to leave. Of course, if the one who just came in leaves, then I haven't changed anything. But if one of the others leaves, then the star gets the label of the one that's leaving. So again, yeah. Elizabeth, is that the same as having the joint distribution of pi 6 and pi 7 under you and Sam, under the Chinese restaurant? Given the Pi 6 guy, you sample the Pi 7 guy, and then given the Pi 7 guy, you sample conditionally back to the Pi 6 guy, so you run Chinese restaurant forward and then backwards to get another Pi I, 6 guy? I think so, but yeah. you would probably know better than I do. Right. I think it is. But, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes if somebody at the same table leaves, and again, you haven't changed anything, but if somebody at a different table leaves, then eventually what you do is move this gamete is now part of this group. Or in this case, this gamete moves from this group into the other group because the star gets the label E. So essentially what this does is precisely what we want. It allows us to have a model, a simple model. It, it's probably not a real model. It's, it's a prior model uh, for what's going on uh, in terms of the sorts of changes in IBD that can happen along the chromosome.
Uh, I was going to show you, uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll show you uh, so some little bits of results we've done with just six gametes. The problem is, again, a point made by Nick, I think, the number of partitions goes up hugely, so it's very hard to think about partitions among large numbers of gametes. It's not so hard to think about six gametes or three individuals, so we've been doing a lot of test examples on that. This is just a representation of the underlying space. There are 203 states here ordered in lexicographic ordering from the case where they're all IBD to the case uh, where they're none of them IBD. Uh, and each node represents a potential partition. And the lines represent the possible transitions that are, can, can occur under the process I just described, uh, where the color represents the label of the gamete that's leaving, the one that hands hits that, the one that's changing, uh, potentially changing uh, his IBD partition. And the levels here are just the different levels of IBD, 6, 5, and 1, 4, and 2, and so on, up to one pair IBD. And, and the color is not uniquely determined in the case when it's a pair resolving, or, but that's one representation. Uh, shall I show the next one? Actually, yes, I'll show it. This is just a very simple little example of one where we did our HMM and again now doing realizations of our, uh, this was out of a simulated population. This is just a small block of 2,000 SNPs over 50 million base pairs. Uh, and this is the truth. And the other 10, five on either side, are realizations from the posterior. Uh, but one thing I'll point out about here is that the, the, the labeling problem. This is the main reason I wanted to show this. Uh, so, for example, if you look at this guy up here in the top left, the blue guy at the bottom there, he may become IBD. I wonder if I can show this on the screen. He may become IBD because he actually becomes IBD with the magenta one, as he does there. He may change color simply because other things have become IBD, and that's the labeling you happen to use. There's an arbitrariness in the labeling that says here we're going to use the so-called canonical ordering labeling. So if there's only five distinct gametes, you don't get a blue color. You don't get a gamete six. You don't get a thing six. There are other ways you can do it where you can actually say that I will only allow my gametes to This is exactly the same representation, same results, but just with a different representation of the labeling. Uh, now, only a gamete will only change color if he does actually change his IBD, uh, but it's not clear that that's really any easier way to do things. Uh, because colors now have no meaning across realizations and across chromosomes, because it'll depend on what happened in the previous history of which color is available, which table is available for the new gamete to sit at, right? <laughs> Uh, the, uh, one other point I'll make about this one, this is an area of deliberately a very, very high LD. Obviously, my realizations have trouble. Nine out of 10 of my realizations had big trouble with this region right here. The nice things about realizations is, OK, you've got your real, real realizations that maybe don't take LD into account or not very well. Uh, but, you, but, you can, but then you're going to use these as multiple imputations in some trait analysis. You can weight them by the LD. So you downweight the regions locally that have, have the high LD in accordance with the local haplotype frequency as compared to the frequency that you use to generate them. I'm sorry, I'm missing how, how are you building LD into the, the Chinese restaurants? Or uh, I'm not. Model? These, these are run raw. Cool. And then I, what I'm going to do is use, use LD information afterwards to downweight areas of, downweight in, inferences that have much lower probability under a correct LD model than under the one I generated. Simple, simple way to weight them. That's a really nice thing about realizations. You can weight things left, right, and center. Uh, but the biggest, uh, the biggest thing out of this, uh, again, uh, this is the next one's older. But really what we see here is that there is a labeling problem. And it was a labeling problem that we ran into, ran into in pedigrees when we were doing these sort of things in pedigrees a few years ago. And some really nice work by Hoyt Kepke has really enabled us to do things really efficiently. Hoyt was not my graduate student. He was a student uh, in our department, much more computer science oriented than I am. Uh, because the point about these identity by descent grants is that the nodes have no natural meaning. They only have meaning through the things that impinge upon them, that, that, is that, the, that these three individuals share this DNA IBD, right? That's the only thing that matters. Uh, and, uh, and when you drew these realizations, on a base pair scale, they're fairly slowly changing, right? So, so we have ranges of markers, ranges of markers, ranges of base pairs uh, for which it doesn't change. 
we have different realizations where if my data are strong, we're going to get the same realizations of the structure, though possibly with a different labeling, as we saw. Uh, and uh, yeah, and different labelings. Uh, so so to having software that recognizes when the structure, the IV data graph structure is the same, uh, really can increase uh, the efficiency of any genetic analysis you do subsequently. Because you only have to do it once for each different structure that you have, and then apply that structure wherever you meet it. Uh, so it's really, yeah, it's really made life much, much easier. Uh, and it, what it does is also allow us to have trait models if we want to, uh, that actually depend not just on the IBD at a single locus, the classic simple ones, but allow on the joint pattern of IBD that we have for a different loci. Uh, because we had, again, because we had these realizations of this joint IBD across the chromosome. Okay. Okay, I'm doing fine. So oh, that went fairly fast. Okay. Uh, so that's fine. We started with Anne Louise Leutenegger doing two gametes. We then did a lot of work with four gametes that I haven't talked about, pairs of individuals. Uh, then more recently, we've been looking at six gametes where you can still run the HMM. But of course, we want to look at large numbers of gametes. Uh, and each, and each, in a large population, it may be that each component graph is not that, is not that large. So the actual IBD graph, the uh, any locus is not, the, the components are not that large. But we want to be able to do the inference for a much larger number of gametes. And again, the problem is well, you simply can't do the HMM. The number of partitions is simply huge. Uh, and there have been various MCMC approaches that I won't, won't talk about. Uh, Xiao Zizeng, again, has done a full Bayesian MCMC uh, under, under essentially this Chinese restaurant process model, which handles up to 40 gametes and can do things basically across a chromosome. Uh, and that's actually right now in press in the Journal of Computational Biology. And Chris Glazner, my current student, has been trying very hard to get a particle filter MCMC approach to work. And it, and it sort of works, but it's, it's hard. It's a hard problem when you have these very large state spaces. But an earlier approach that's due to Chris Glazner has been working really well, and I'll show you the results on that. So basically what he does is, is like uh, Matthew Stevens' product of proximate conditional, the pack likelihood in some sense, building the IBD state across a chromosome, adding diploid individuals successively to the IBD state, sampling them by what you've already uh, computing for, and sampling back by what you've already inferred. So to take the very first steps of it with just three individuals, and then it builds from there, uh, you might take your first two individuals, and infer the identity by descent between them, conditional on their marker data. Come on. Conditional on their marker data, A and B, conditional on the marker data on A and B. Then you take a third individual and infer the identity by descent state between B and C, given what, what you're constrained already between A and B, but given the data not on A, B, and C, but only on B and C. That's where the approximation comes in. And then having done that, you do the third leg of the triangle uh, and infer the identity by descent state between A, individual A and individual C. We're dealing with pairs of individuals at each stage, so that's just 15 states of identity among their four gametes, quite easy to do. Uh, conditional on what you've already inferred between A and B and between B and C, and conditional this time on the data on A and the data on C. And then you can prove that you can build up from there basically only ever considering triangles, uh, three sets of three individuals at a time, and it will give you, uh, it gives you your realizations. So one way or another, using these Markov models for the latent IBD, having marker data that is dependent on the latent IBD state, we do have these methods for realizing this identity by descent among individuals that you don't know to be related. And we wanted to see how that would work in a fairly classic uh, pe pedigree context, but, but not knowing the pedigree. So here's a pedigree. When I do the analysis, I'm not going to use this pedigree, right? I want to make that very clear. But to simulate the data, we had a pedigree. Uh, and in this particular one, we actually had, a, and this came from a real pedigree study originally, but that's sort of by the way. We had a founder up here who had a, uh, an allele who had a fairly strong uh, positive effect on a quantitative trait. Uh, that allele segregated down to these three families at the bottom. 
uh, and then we simulated uh, SNP data. Oh, so then we simulated trait data on these green yellow guys down at the bottom. Uh, and then we uh, uh, simulated SNP data on the chromosome, conditional on the inheritance of that, the trait locus uh, simulated SNP data across the chromosome. So we have SNP marker data on the, these yellow green guys down the bottom. And then we threw away the pedigree. But we, ha but we could infer the IBD. And a LOD score is just a function of the IBD. You don't need the pedigree. We tend to think of the classic linkage LOD score as something you compute on a pedigree. It's actually a function of the IBD, not of the pedigree. Or well, given the IBD, the pedigree is irrelevant, same as we saw on that very first graph. Uh, and the black line here, and again, we simulated a trait that would give us a fairly strong signal. But, so, uh, but the black line here is what the LOD score we would get across the chromosome. This is the true trait location. Uh, if we could observe that true IBD in our individuals. The blue dotted line is what we got if we simply threw the genotypic data on those green guys down the bottom. I think there's about 30 of them. Yeah on these guys just through the genotypic, genotypic data, unfazed, uh, at, at, the, at the IBD inference, and then from the IBD inference estimated the LOD score. And you see we do pretty well, but we don't really get everything, we do everything we would like to, and we don't get quite so strong a signal. But if we have phased data on those individuals down the bottom, we essentially recover the true LOD score, or the LOD score given the true IBD. Uh, some people have said, well, uh, so it's all coming from these close relatives down the bottom, so and you can obviously infer the IBD very well between the close relatives. In fact, that's not true. If you look at the LOD score just given the little pedigrees down the bottom, you get a tiny, tiny hump there. You don't get anything like the LOD score you're seeing there. So, it's <coughs> uh, so yeah, I think that's the story. Uh, and I guess the conclusion is that we really can base our genetic analysis. In the modern world, we can base our genetic analysis on inferred IBD because we can get the real, these realizations of the IBD given our SNP data. And whether you're talking about pedigrees or populations, uh, the, every, all your test statistics, whether it's a association test, or association and identity test, uh, or a LOD score, your IBD-based test statistics, they're all just functions of the IBD. Uh, modeling the sense is important because, uh, but again, the details of the model turn out to not matter very much. Uh, but the fact that our DNA comes in segments, the human genomes in, uh, in, is important. It is very important to be flexible in your models. Uh, and I've come to think that assuming a pedigree structure, those big ancestral pedigrees we used to love so much, uh, you don't know that right. And it's very inflexible. It's far too inflexible when, for many of these analyses. Uh, always assume error in your marker data. Uh, we actually, I didn't go into it, but actually we do allow a slight generalization on our Chinese restaurant process because sometimes there are events in the ancestry of chromosomes <laughs> that move more than one gamete from an IBD group to another group. Uh, and that's it. And there, there are the references. And again, I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Sharon Browning, uh, Hoyt Kepke, who did the IBD work, and Louise Leutenegger, who did the original HMM for this IBD inference, and Xiaozi Zheng, who's uh, been doing this more recent IBD-based inference. And Chris Glazner hasn't published this work yet. Uh, he's busy writing up his thesis, uh, but he was on an earlier paper where we were dealing with pairs of individuals. Thank you. degree of relationship, that all you needed is really is the IBD segments. But yeah. if, you, if you did know the degree of relationship, doesn't that give you a good prior that helps somehow in inference of IBD regions? Yeah, but it turns out the prior doesn't matter much. The data, the data are so strong in inferring these IBD segments, particularly when you start to combine it across more than pairs of individuals, that so long as I have a reasonable value of, of beta and a sensible value of alpha, uh, and the model that I isn't exactly right, it, it works. I'll get the same IBD segments. Yun Song's finding the same thing, right? We used to worry much more about that model. Um, 
but but yes, I mean, I, yeah. Yeah, and, and knowing the degree of relatedness, you know, these guys at the particular, these more remote levels of relatedness, they may or may not share anything IBD anyhow. So just knowing some sort of expected level of relatedness isn't, isn't really helping. Yeah, Graham. So in your Chinese restaurant process along the genome, am I changing between each SNP or is it instantaneous at each base pair along the genome? I, I may have missed that. A very good question. No, you didn't miss it. That was something I swept under the rug. <laughs> um, yeah, we actually do a, we, we've actually got better approximations now, but we don't exponentiate the continuous, uh, continuous curve. Um, so that's why, that's why I was interested particularly in Steve's talk, where, though I'm not going to try and do anything nearly as complicated as Steve does. Uh, because, yeah, we, we, we approximate it by a discrete SNP to SNP transition, which, works, which is pretty accurate with our new approximations. Uh, um, uh, so the nice thing about the particle filter, and one reason why we had big hopes for the particle filter, sorry, I've lost it, uh, Chris Glazner is doing part Monte Carlo particle filter approach, and there he is using the continuous process to generate things. So, the, so that's why we hoped that the particle filter was going to do good things for us, because we hoped it was then going to be enable us to use an actual genuine continuous underlying model. And, and thinking about the parameters of the Chinese restaurant process, yeah. does, does, so most individuals aren't clustered together. So does that theta parameter end up being very small? Uh, yes, well, so beta is the sort of pairwise kinship in the population, and it depends on how deep you want to go. Uh, in most of our examples, whoops, sorry, I'm losing things again. Uh, in the simulated population, we actually ended up relative to 200 generations ago, which was probably trying to push things too far back, uh, with a pairwise kinship of, of, of 0.05. Yes, most of the time, the prior is that most of the time uh, you're going to be in a state of no IBD, whereas this, uh, here, this, which, which there wasn't particularly much of on this chromosome segment. Uh, there's some. Um, I think under these particular parameter values, about half the time you're in the state of no IBD in the six gametes. The, the that, true state, the true state. That, back to Graham's first question then. So that, that means you're assuming that the SNP density is greater enough that there's not more, that you didn't miss any IBD switches. Yeah. Between well, our recent approximation allows up to two switches between a pair of SNPs, but yes. And is that also what limits it to 40 gametes, or is that just computation? Um, that's just computation. But, you, but you're right that uh, you can have more, you get more changes as you get more gametes. So. Uh, that's something we're probably going to have. To, uh, oh, wait, sorry. That again, MCMC. Uh, Shaozi has got this very neat MCMC, and again, he is using the continuous, uh, continuous process in his, his MCMC one. 